um, session, which I believe is our fifth session five. And it's, um, we had um, the same topic last week, creating a unified story. And um, so uh, something very interesting came out last week about um, having a bank of mentors, which I immediately have acted on. <laughs> But without speaking for too much, I just hand over now to Dr. Buki Owosheni, um, um, uh, a wonderful um, alumna of the uh, MBBS graduating class of 2004, and um, also has a master's in comparative literature and criticism. And she's going to be taking us through another wonderful session. We are using these sessions to reflect, and I'm hoping that we have both staff and students on this um, in this meeting to reflect about what where we want to go are we going to break the frame are we going to think out of the box what are the other things we need to put in place in our curricula um, many times we just look at the content and um, are we going to have a lot more processes are we going to be thinking about things about mentoring and include them in the curriculum? What are the kinds of things we really want to have um, to really make sure we, we do the very best? So let's listen on again. And I want to welcome everyone who has who's joined already. Um, Professor Oluwatosi, I welcome you again, the chairman of the curriculum development committee in the College of Medicine. Um, I can also see that one of our sub-deans is on today, Dr. Um, Marco Njola, who is the subdean um, faculty of basic. And of course, the e-learning chair, um, Dr. Dole is here and um, Professor Olu, um, Olu Sonia and a couple of others. So let's just go on and um, let's listen to you. Over to you, um, Dr. Owusheni. Let's listen to you as you take us through this um, creating a, a unified story. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wibodin. It's always a pleasure to be here. A lovely series. I am, in fact, as I'm going through the series, I myself am learning so much. Um, and there is there are just so many intersections between um, science and art. And it's just fascinating to see the ideas that come out of it. And I'm hoping that even beyond these series, we'll be able to take other ideas forward um, and continue to do the, continue to support the good work that the College of Medicine is already doing. So we're going to talk about session, this is session five of the creativity series. My screen is up on that. And this is the second part of last week, because last week we we're talking about creating a unified story and there was quite a lot in it. So um, I thought we would continue the discussion again for this week and have sort of flesh out one or two ideas from it. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen. Yes, okay. So um, do interrupt me if, if I'm not loud enough or if you know there's anything going on with the screen. Thank you. So, just a recap, um, so this is our fifth session and our first session we're introducing the idea of the unified self and that basically means bring our whole self and not compartmentalizing ourselves into this is my student life, this is my work life, this is my home life. The, um, the separations are not clear cut and the picture in the left hand top corner is um, a painting by Arabo Mokwai, Yin and Yang. And it's trying to show that there is no clear cut difference between things. There is, there are overlaps and there is beauty in the places where these things collide. There are things to be learned in the intersections. And it's something that um, my hope is we bring to the fore in our private lives and the curriculum helps to bring out as well. Jumped myself there. Okay, session two, we talked about how the unified self leaves clues and there are, there's information about ourselves that we attend, that we find in other activities. They relate, you know, one thing relates to another and we need to continue to pay attention to ourselves in the flow state, understanding the things we like, understanding the things we, how we retain information, understanding the things that make us work well are important for us so that when we're in the fiery furnace of academics, we would be able to um, call on the things that we know support us when we are in our flow state. 
So session three was about how we frame our stories. And we looked at this by plastic carving by Lamidi Fakaye, done in the 19, 1960. And we saw that unlike most of his work, there was a small section in there where he had to break the frame to incorporate a drummer. And we found that it wasn't, I'm sure he was probably, probably a bit disappointed in having to do that, but the drummer was necessary. And sometimes when something is important to our story, we can break a frame. The drummer transformed this piece from just a, a, an image of a man with beating a horse to a celebration. The drummer makes it a celebration. The drummer makes it a praise image. The, 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 um, the drummer brings in this idea of valor and glory and things that are worth praising. So that drummer, it was worth it, breaking that frame for him to put that drummer in. So sometimes when we have our own story, our ideas of ourselves, or ideas of our curriculum, things that we know are tried and tested, but we know that when we have a vision for a story that's bigger than what our curriculum can contain, when you have sort of a bigger imagination for yourself, a bigger imagination for your story, sometimes we feel uncomfortable, but sometimes we do need to break that frame. So in session four, we talked about the hero's journey and we looked at the idea of Joseph Campbell um, was, um, was uh, an, um, he, he worked in comparative religion and comparative mythology and he compared mythologies all over the world. And he came up with this idea of the hero's journey and he wrote a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And it's one of many tools. There's so many tools one can use to chart a vision or create a tool. It's just one. It's just one idea. But it represents a journey and um, it's used very popularly in narrative and cinema. And it's a method, we talked about how it's a method that actually works because it appeals to so many people. And in that, we just picked out a few elements and we talked about mentorship as, as something that's vital for the journey. On the start of every journey, every hero story, Superman, Spider-Man, um, everything in cinema that we watch, the hero sets up, the hero does have to meet this. It's an old wise man or a old wise woman who tells them the way. There is always mentorship on the start of the journey. And without that, we see that in the hero's journey, the hero doesn't get far without somebody telling them which way to go. So, and that is so relevant to our environment at the College of Medicine, that mentorship path, that idea of someone who's gone the, the road before you, pointing out things, it makes the journey so much easier and it increases the likelihood of success. So where we then ended up was talking about six sessions, 12 ideas, one method. And that was what we're doing from the very beginning. So this is the fifth session. We have just one more session to go. And the eight ideas that we talked about are here. Um, the one method that serves everything, if you don't remember anything else, is what you remember is to pay attention, to pay attention to yourself. And that sounds very obvious because we feel that, oh, this is a self-centered generation. We're always looking at ourselves in our you know, mirrors and selfie sticks, but it is not as narcissistic as perhaps it should be. And the narcissism is not in that looking at yourself in order to present to the world. It's looking at yourself in order to understand. When you a person who understands themselves, is actually a person who's more likely to understand others. A person who has looks, looks at nuances within themselves is able to see themselves in other people. They're able to identify one or two things. And when we see ourselves in other people, that bonds us closer to them. We have more patience with them. Um, it helps us to have better relationships with them. So a little bit of that narcissism in introspection and trying to understand what makes me tick and how can I call on these things that make me tick? They actually help um, in so many areas. So today we're going to talk about telling a story, more of the detail behind that hero's journey. And that hero's journey is the idea of, um, of, of, of the hero leaving home, charting new territory. And it's something that we can plot throughout um, and, and throughout sort of our lives in different areas. Uh, we can have the journey of a life. Someone can say, okay, the beginning of my journey was when I was born. And then, you know, the middle of the story is when I was 30 years old. And then you keep going that way. You can also have the hero's journey of learning a new skill. You say, oh, I, 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 I decided um, to become sort of a surgeon. So your story then does not begin when you were born. Your story does not begin when you um, attended, um, got admission to university. The story begins when I wrote the exams. 
and, and I became a resident. So the story starts somewhere else and you start all the way again from the beginning. And even though you've had mentors at the, at the very beginning in all sorts of ways, in secondary school, university, all the way, all of a sudden your story starts afresh. The mentors that served you then will not serve you anymore. Why? It's a new story. So understanding these patterns helps us um, and understand that we can actually write a story before it is ended actually helps us to um, have a pragmatic approach. Storytelling is actually quite emotive, but at the same time, there is this pragmatic approach where we can see a pattern and we can chart where we are. So when we want to tell a story, the question then is who has the right to tell a story? And with the story, we say, most people say, well, I'm not a storyteller, you know, this is uh, art, art stuff is not for me. I'm a science person, that's why I'm here. And it's not necessarily um, the domain of only the artist. Um, everyone has a right to tell a story and everyone does have stories. Even the people who think, you know, they have nothing to say, they do. People say, um, you know, you always have people say, oh, my father used to say, um, you know, and he was dish out a proverb, a stitch in time saves nine. By repetition, he's ended up telling this story and it has this narrative of this is what happens when you don't do things in time and their story. So a story doesn't always begin with once upon a time. There's so many ways of formatting it. So the next slide, I'm not sure, I hope it works. Um, I have a, um, I have a little poem that I wrote, I wrote many years ago, about five or six years ago, um, but I think it's quite fitting and it's called The Song of the Storyteller. And it's all about telling stories and who has a right to tell the story. The song of the storyteller has been sung from the crowning of creation. She is the griot. She is the bard. She is just a satirist and moonlit mouthpiece. The three thousand silent tales. Poet of the body, she is the poet of the song. The story pulls and pulls, and then it pushes me, it drops me into the yawning cavern of its own secret revelation. It cocoons and entices me with words deftly twisted together, like a plaid face tightly atop my head. Or a threefold cord woven lightly around my waist, it laps at my thigh. It carries no burden. He is the griot. He is the bard. He is just a satirist, a moonlit mouthpiece to three thousand silent tales. Poet of the body. He is the poet of the song. invade the night to penetrate through ears, dreams, and times. Not for her wild gesticulations, no need for flailing arms to entreat and convince. Because 3,000 messengers have been set loose, they pour fat oil onto blinded tongues, tongues that have long, long lost their way. Drummer, dreamer, and dream weaver, you stand with your head kissed by song. The broken arches of your feet nestle with the grit of the moon, but do not let go. Because you are the griot, you are the bard, you are just a satirist, a moonlit mouthpiece to 3,000 silent tales, poet of the body. You are the poet of the song. 
Alo, alo te ru, alo. Okay, so so that was my idea of who has a right to tell a story, and for me, the story is told by. Oh, is there a hand raised? Um, and it's all about who has a right to tell a story. And the answer to who has a right to tell a story is everyone. Because, I mean, in the poem, I said 3,000 silent tales. And that's true because every iteration of that journey that we go through in all different aspects of our lives, it's another story. It's a fresh story. The story is always starting again and again. With every new thing we do, every new thing we learn, we start again at the beginning, you know, we, we become babies again, time and time and time again. So it's as if we go through the whole stage of childhood from baby to child to an adult repeatedly. So these are all fresh stories. So time and time again, a fresh story is evolving. So we have multiple stories going on at the same time. And it's useful to see where we are in the story, because where we are, and I will show you two reasons why where we are in the story matters. I will show you two reasons why it's useful to plot a story that is not yet finished because we can identify certain things within it. So we look at Sigmund Freud and I know many people know a lot more about Freud than I do. But the little I know about Freud, um, I'm going to just talk about two, two of his works. Um, it was an essay, Remembering, Repeating and Working through and then there's Beyond the Pleasure Principle 1920 and Beyond the Ple Pleasure Principle is sort of the famous work but the, the, um, the, the one in 1914 was one of the works one of some works that actually led up to forming his ideas for Beyond the Pleasure Principle and basically his ideas were about how instinct to drive certain things and he was saying that there are actually some motivations that um, and that, you know, pleasure is, 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 a, is, a, is a major driving force, but that there are actually some things that stand beyond the pleasure principle that can actually change motivations. And I remember repeating and working through, there was the idea that, um, that the mind contains the past. And, um, and, you know, we see that a lot in psychoanalytics. That's one of the you know, important ideas that's come through. But the idea that the mind contains the past, even though we don't understand what it is. So the analyst and the analysand, the person, anal the person being analyzed, the patient, is sort of encouraged in psychoanalysis to, you know, talk about, you know, tell me about your childhood with the idea that things that even the patient themselves cannot recognize, things might, you know, patterns might begin to form. So the idea is that remembering, instead of sort of avoiding certain ideas, because you might find in psychoanalysis, you find that, you know, they say, tell me about, tell me about your mother. And then the person says, why should we talk about her? I don't want to talk about her. And straight away, you know, the, the psychoanalyst might start to wonder, hmm, is there, is there something there? As obvious avoidance. Um, so avoidance is easy, but the idea was that when we, when we remember, then we allow the process of repetition to, and re repetition is not a thing in itself. Repetition is, it's it's only when you identify that you can call it repetition. So for example, I can, you know, I can clap my hands. If I don't pay attention to the clapping of my hands, I don't know that I'm repeating this activity. Someone else that's observing repeatedly can say, this is repetition. And when someone says this is repetition, then I start, then, then I pause and I think, oh, I'm, why am I, why am I, you know, doing this same compulsive motion? But if I'm not observing, I don't even know, I don't remember, and there is no way for me to establish a pattern of repetition, then I don't know that I'm you know, doing this, and therefore I can't ascribe any sort of sense or meaning to it. So the idea was that remembering allows you to work through things, it allows you to clarify, and you're able to sort of in your mind, things that you've closed your mind to, things you've shut your mind to, things that you don't even know that you're doing, you begin to see these patterns. And when you begin to see these patterns, then you can, you know, do something about them. And one of the purposes of this of this understanding was um, was was to move from a situation of passivity to being active in a story. And so I'm linking this to storytelling. So from being passive to being active. Um, and there was an experiment that he, um, 
picky. The absurd, absurd child, sort of, you know, the Freudian way of strange experiments was observing a child, um, I think, throwing a toy. The toy would disappear. The child would say, ta-da, the toy will reappear. Or sometimes the toy wouldn't reappear. And Freud talked about, oh, this child is looking at, uh, this, repeating the disappearance of his mother as a way of sort of trying to deal with this, you know, mother goes away, I cry, and then she comes back. Um, and then sometimes playing with the idea of mother not coming back. And to Freud, his idea was this, that this child playing with this thing is actually looking for a way, yes, to deal with this idea, but by repeating it, he's trying to obtain mastery over this event, trying to control something that can't really be controllable. I, I can't control my mother leaving each time, but I'm going to repeat and you know continue repeating this activity I'm beginning to deal with this abandonment. I'm, be, I'm finding a way to sort of be in charge. I'm no longer this passive person because this, this passive stage of being the one being abandoned com, um, continually, it's a very frustrating and uncomfortable place to be. So the tendency is to want to move to a place of, to, to, to a place of sort of mastery of it. And that is where a parallel can be drawn in the story. If I'm told that I be, I'm doing this and you're repeating, I'm cl clapping my hands, it, why, why are you doing this? Why are you doing it repeatedly? Now that I've, I've established that there's repetition here, I'm telling a story about something going on with my hands. I'm in a position to say, oh, wait, I can intervene in this story. Now repetition in this sense, it creates movement and it's, it, it moves, and when we identify repetition, then all of a sudden we move to something that we can actually do something about. So within the mind, we're able to work through something, we're able to clarify what exactly is happening here, what's going on. So that brings me to the idea, the ninth idea, and then it's Freud, is that repetition actually symbolizes meaning. So we see it often enough, it's sort of intuitive. We say, um, if you play with matches, you get burned. Why do we say that? Because we've seen people play with matches time and time again, and we see people get burned time and time again. And over time, we've, 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 we've associated the matches and the burning and the repetition. And then we say, okay, we've seen this 600 times now. Therefore, we can create this proverb and this idea that there is meaning here. Playing with matches means getting burned. So it no longer looks like an isolated series of events. We no longer look like these accidents of which uh, we have no control over. Now, looking at it from an academic setting, from a, from a, from a student setting, there is this, you, you leave home and all of a sudden you're in this massive environment that has you know, thousands of people, students, lecturers, everybody. You're just moving as one of the crowd and moving as one of the herd. It is useful to identify a familiar story cycle to ground you and to ground your bearing. Then you find meaning in this situation. But moving along with the herd, uh, we have classes. These are the things they are going to do to us. <laughs> you know, we have the typical, they will fail us. There's so much this fear of this passivity. They will, you know, we, it's always, they always fail us. You know, we don't fail, they fail us. There is passivity in so many things because this is an unfamiliar story where that child who's being abandoned by the mother. But when we take a toy and we, re re it's, the toy is not the same as the mother, but that ability to repeat even in something else, it creates meaning that we can bring to bear in this particular place. And that's one of the usefulness of, that's the usefulness of, you know, stories and fairy tales. So I'm scared, I'm in, I'm in my, my third year, things are looking challenging this year. If I can tell a story about that particular event, this particular scenario I'm in, and if I can relate that to a story when I was in SS2, I begin to see that there's a repetition here. I was scared there too. So this was my journey. I arrived at the school, I was the hero. I arrived as the hero. I, 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 I lost my way for a bit. I found a mentor, a fellow student who was one year ahead of me. She showed me what to do. Then I did this and I did that. And then you begin to see the story. Most times you will find that you are back again in that same story. You are back again in that same story. You're now the hero at university. These are the things that are happening. 
and being able to see that these stories are quite similar and there's repetition here, then you begin to have some idea of meaning. And then, as Freud says, there is that, there is that beginning of an idea from moving from passivity to an active mastery. We can't control everything. There's, there's nothing, it's, it's so many things are out of our hand, but some things are within our hands. And having an idea of what is and what isn't actually helps to move things forward. So relating that to storytelling, again, bringing that back to storytelling. There's a book of Peter Brooks and he talked about narrative and design and intention. It's a very dense statement and I'll explain basically what he says. It says that narrative must always present itself as a repetition of events that have already happened. So he's talking about novels generally. You read a novel, the novel is telling you what has happened. It's just repeating it. And it says within this postulate, this generalized repetition, it makes use of specific perceptible repetition to create a plot. That is, it shows us the significant interconnection of events. So when we look at many of these stories together, it's similar. There's a hero. Hero comes, talks to the old man. The old man says, go this way. He goes that way, meets the girl. They always meet the girl. They always get the girl. This is what they do. And they know at the end, they return home and then their lives have changed and they become better people. There is that story. So one book, similar to another, they're not the same. Like Batman is not Superman but there is generalized repetition. And this repetition creates plot. Plot is hero, somebody trying to take over the world. Somebody trying to destroy everything and the hero stands against it. The plot is the same. So then there are now events within it. So the events, the little parts of the story, which is what I showed last week on the hero's journey, the different steps along the journey of the hero, so when this event is repeated, then it gains meaning. And that repetition, the event, the meaning, is both the recall of an earlier moment and a variation of it. Sounds a bit confusing. What essentially it means is, as you're telling the story, you are changing it. So imagine I'm a cinema producer and I say, oh, I've watched Batman, I want to create Superman. It's the same story. But as I'm telling it, I'm telling the exact same story as Spider-Man. But as I'm telling it, thinking of Superman, I'm actually changing it. So we, as we're telling our story, because we're telling something that is, has happened in the past and is already currently happening and hasn't yet happened in the future, we're actually changing it. So when we tell a story of, uh, oh, I, I arrive here in, 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 in uh, UCH and I'm afraid, and it's the exact same story as I arrived in secondary school and I was afraid. It's the same story. We always start from the same spot. We start from the same spot. We start home where we're comfortable and then we move into the uncomfortable and the frightening. The story is the same as I'm telling the story of UCH and I'm mapping out that story. I'm changing it. Because even though the journey is the same, every single plot and every single um, 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 idea underneath it begins to change because I'm telling it. So I, I'm remembering it, just like Freud says, we remember it in order to, what's the phrase? Remembering it, I'm, I'm remembering it so I can repeat it. And I'm also working through it. And at the same time, I'm bearing it, I'm changing it. So it's a process of creation. As we're saying the story, we're creating it, we're changing it, and we're remembering at the very same time. So now it brings things kind of confusing. So now we now know when people say, oh, there is nothing new under the sun. Oh, we've, you know, I think last week we were talking about tradition and how comforting that is. And people are so reluctant to change things. And then they say, oh, don't come here with your fancy ideas. There's nothing new under the sun. We've been here for 45 years and this is how we do things. And to an extent, they are correct. Tradition, is, an, is a form of repetition and we do it in order to create meaning. We, you know, um, we play with matches, you get burnt. You play with matches, you get burnt. You play with matches, you get burnt. So we have this tradition where we don't play with matches. You know, we don't play with matches. That's 
the meaning that we've created. So we're very reluctant to relinquish this meaning because it's not for nothing. It came through a lot of um, experiments. Things have happened. Things have gone, you know, past. So that's why, you know, the people might look at you, cry, oh, you're new here. Oh, oh, you don't know as much as we know. There's nothing new under the sun. And to an extent, they're right. But... When they say there's nothing new under the sun, perhaps we can decide that they are replying, there, there are, um, we can imply that they are describing the journey. True, nothing changes about the journey. You arrive, you go through trials, things are difficult, people help you, you need mentors, your friends help you along the way, you have a, a back, um, What's that word? You, you, you have a you, you fall back, you know, you have a setback. You have a setback. Everybody has setbacks. It's part of the hero's journey. You know, those who don't have setbacks are lying. So someone tells you, oh, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, this is how we've done this for 45 years at the college. So your new fancy ideas will tell you what happens at the beginning. We start, we start here, we start at the journey. There are setbacks, you did a mentor, you get some allies, you recover from the setbacks because of those setbacks and the whole journey you've been through at the end, you're changed and you become a very different person. And they say, so that's, but that's how it has been for 40 years, we know. And to an extent, they're true in that tradition. But where things can now change is where we create variation. We can now create variation because remember I said that as we're telling the story, we're changing it. There's no point telling a story that's exactly the same as the other. No one will buy novels that are exactly the same as the other. They have the same general tradition, the same general story point. But what changes is the subplot. The subplot changes the story. The general idea is the same. Where we can change our stories, when we change the details within it, change the choices within it, change you know, so many different parts of it. So Peter Brooks says, the subplot stands as one means of warding off the danger of short circuit, assuring that the main plot will continue through to the end. What is the main plot? In Jaws, for example, because we talked about different films and how they relate to the hero's journey. We talked about it seeing in so much of American cinema. So in Jaws, the plot is, we know the ending, the, the man has to kill the shark that's trying to kill everybody. That's the ending, but he has so many problems. So what happens? The writers introduce the subplot. The man is about to fail, but then there's somebody who knows how to get a better boat and the person has to come in. All these things are going to come into our place to try to help us finish out the story. And that is where we can begin to change things. So when we identify a story of my previous life and my current life, and this is where I am, I'm looking as if my story will be changed or interrupted, I might not get to the end of the story. That is where we begin to rely on subplot. That means we're not changing the main story. We're not changing the college. The people who fear that, oh, we can't change this because this is how we've done it for 40 years. We will continue to do it in, you know, to some extent. But frames can be broken and subplots can be can be um, can be can be brought in because you know we're okay with your tradition, we're okay with your main plot, because your main plot actually the purpose of it is to get to a particular ending. So we're fine with that. But as it stands, we're in danger of not getting to that ending. So then we begin to introduce subplots. Now the idea of a subplot is quite is quite an interesting one, and it's one that um, can be explored um, because some people start out, you know, with their with this with the with the subjects they want to study and an idea of this is what I will do, um, this is what my degree will be in, and along the way the road their setback is not a minor setback of I failed a test or I failed an exam. Sometimes it's like I failed the whole year or I, I failed the year twice, and I have to leave. Now, knowing that there are subplots that actually can continue through to the right end is a great antidote against despair. Knowing that, knowing that the story will be bumpy and that there will be setbacks and you know, the plot is continually changing and knowing that 
as we're telling the story, we're changing the story and creating the story as we go along, we can begin to explore other elements. We can begin to understand what can I bring in as a salt plot that will help this story continue to the right end. Because the right end, sometimes you have this preconditioned idea of the right end. We think, oh, the right end is I have this particular degree. It's not, because once you get the degree, another story starts. You might not even be, you know, that you might find having having the successful ending of a particular story might not even be as elated, elating as you think it would have been. It's not as exhilarating as you thought it would be. The excitement lasts for a while, and then two days later you find, oh my goodness, a fresh story has begun. So the stories keep going, the plots keep going. So beginning to look at it in detail, then we begin to see how we can look at some plots. So I'm going to look at some of the things on the hero's journey that we looked at last week and just begin to think about what parallels can we draw as we're revising a curriculum. This is the complicated version. Um, this is a simpler version. So when we look at it, you can see that whether I'm off to start a new course or whether I'm off to learn basketball, the story remains the same, but then each time I chart, the, I chart the journey. Each time I can reduce the duration of, the, of certain parts of the journey, I can increase the duration of certain parts of the journey. And by drafting it out, just writing out on a piece of paper, each of these steps in different areas of of your life, you can begin to see where your weaknesses are. You might see that if you chart, for example, let's say someone charts a um, secondary school journey and says, okay, I left home, I went to boarding school. Who was my mentor? I didn't have one. Then you can begin to see that I had so many trials and failures all along the way. This, the, the trials and failures section took longer than it should have. So as you're telling the same story again in university, because you took the time to observe yourself, pay attention to yourself, chart this story. The same story is going to repeat itself but with the variation in the subplot. Early in the journey, you bring in a mentor. So you're the one changing the story. So like, uh, like the hero in, I don't know, what are these films? I don't know, like uh, the Batman, for example. Rather than bringing the mentor in at 46th minute, you decide I bring the mentor in this time at 26, 26 minutes. And the only reason you know to do that is because you took the time to chart the clapping of your hands, this, this noticing and observing that actually this is repetition now. This is repeating. Paying attention long enough to see that, oh, this is no this is not absent-minded clapping. I'm, I'm actually repeating something. I'm creating this pattern. Yeah, this pattern, the pattern going on. When we chart our journey in different ways, we see it. It doesn't even need to be something as big as an education. It can be something as learning a hobby. Chart your, I, I wanted to learn piano, but I gave up after six months. Chart it on the hero's journey. You'll see where you stopped. You'll see where you stopped. Some people will stop at the play. They never bother to get a teacher. So no, I don't, I don't need to know anybody who plays piano. I'll just learn by myself in my, you know, my BQ. And that might be where you stop. Or it might be at the place of revelation where you say, actually, it requires, you know, a good two, three hours of practice every week to learn piano. And those are some of the activities that we learn in a quiet space with something as simple as piano. So I, I, I give up. I give up when I find that it's actually going to be require a lot of effort. Charting that, you might find that repetition somewhere else. And it's actually a good technique for counselors to chart something that doesn't matter. Chart, get, a, get, a, get your client to chart something very, that doesn't matter at all. You know, this is how I make friends or this is how I bake or this is how I, I don't know, any hobby. And sometimes they might have a re repeated place where, they, where their journey is interrupted again and again. And then you can apply that. Because sometimes if you come straight at a, an academic problem, there might be a bit of resistance, there might be a bit of maybe ego, there might be a bit of fear. It'll be very difficult to see what is going on. But, but by identifying, charting a story in other areas, you might just begin to find patterns. And once you find the pattern, you've moved from passivity to inevitable activity. Because once you realize that the reason I gave up the piano was when I found out that it was two hours of learning every week, 
then you, you have something you can do, you can do something about it, then you understand what happened. So it reduces the mystery. So I would like to challenge everyone, you know, take this, the hero's journey, just jot down in three different areas of your life, pick one, pick one, a hobby, something very simple, football, um, baking, cooking, watching TV, um, writing, so we like to write, chart it and just see how did it start, how did it end with a particular project, what worked well, tick the, tick the section that was really good, really quick, that you progressed and take the section that took so long and chart it again in another area, a challenging area, maybe maybe something you have to study for something that was very difficult, chart it and then, then chart what is currently happening now with the journey you're taking on that hasn't finished yet. Chart it and see where you are. Are you stuck? See where you're stuck and then write down a vision for what an ending looks like. And then start to slot in the sub the subplots because the story is the same, but you get to pick the variation. You get to pick how long, um, you know, when a helper comes in. You have influence in picking um, um, when a helper comes in, you know, asking for help, making allies, um, using gifts, um, making atonement for errors made in the past. There are so many things that are within control. So I challenge you us all if we can have a look at this and see if we can chart that and see if there's any use for that, there's any use for that in our current in our recent situations. So we've talked about paying attention and paying attention, and the question is to what? It's to everything, to be a little bit. So it's to be a little bit narcissistic and to um, to pay attention to ourselves and see what similarities do we have. So what is our story? What's the story of the curriculum? What's the vision for the finished story? What does the finished journey story look like? Um, what's the story for a student coming in at 100 level? What is, what's the story for a student coming in at 200 level, 300 level? What are the subplots? What are the lows that they, um, they can anticipate? The story varied elements, where are the where is the opportunity to include subplots? Do they know that they can include subplots? Do they know that there are variables they can control within their story? Can they call on things that have happened to them in the past and work out a rationale personally for them, a, a sort of a, a, a tailored rationale for themselves? Or are they just, you know, a cookie cutter trying to copy the standard for everyone? So those are things that we can think about. Those are things we can begin to look at. So I will just end by summarizing. We talked about mythic storytelling structure as described by Joseph Campbell as a tool for creating a personal vision. And we talked about Sigmund Freud's ideas about repetition and remembering and how it helps us to work through things. And we talked about the narrative tool of the subplot that though the story is the same, we can create variation each time we tell that story. So we are creating something new each time. And as usual, the method is the same. We have to keep paying attention. Only when we pay attention do we realize that certain things actually are repeating themselves in our story. And when we pay attention, we see the repetition, we move from being um, passive to the form of activity because we know the next step of the journey. And then we try to put in a subplot that will help us get there quicker. Our next will be um, a curriculum to support a unified life, and that will be the last session. And we'll just bring all these ideas together and we'll say, okay, what has that got to do with the curriculum? And how does that support the unified life of students? And how does that um, help the college to, 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 to challenge the changes that um, the changes and the improvements and the upgrading that they're already embarking on? So that will be the next session this time next week. So thank you so much for listening. If we have any comments and questions, I'd be happy to take them. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Buki, for this um, another wonderful session. And um, we really look forward to having you um, on. I mean, continue on as um, <clears throat> a part of what we're doing here in the College of Medicine going ahead. So even when you have your sixth session next week, um, we are already thinking and how we would be able to, you know, integrate a lot of the things you have said and the skills and um, uh, talents that you have 
to be a part of breaking the frame here and also providing us with subplots and stories and uh, mentorship and so many other wonderful things. Um, um, while I just make a few comments, I'm inviting us to write our comments either in the chat box or to put on um, put our hands up. Um, we have quite a number of people who have joined us this um, afternoon. Um, some of the things that again uh, em emphasized is that unified self. That when you are, and I'm going to relate it to developing a curriculum. When we're developing the curriculum. We need to think as that we're developing a curriculum for people who are whole, that for, for, for a unified self, for the whole person, not just for a part or a portion um, or an aspect, but the curriculum is the curricula in the College of Med, the different curricula that we have are being developed for people who are whole. And these people have not only are they you know, training to be physiotherapists, but many of them will have talents in baking, in art, in other forms of creativity. And that needs to be expressed as they go through their journey and their, the, the, the hero's journey. And so that's the first, the, one of the first th the things that I'm thinking about. We are developing curricula for whole people. That's very important. You need to think about them. You need to about their, their mental health, their emotional self, their, their talents, and to see how you can provide for all the expression of all these talents that we have. The other thing that um, was really striking today was your bringing out the issue of positive narcissism. Um, as a psychiatrist, we always think of narcissism in a very negative light, and nobody wants to be seen as a narcissist, somebody's self-love. But what you have done is you've put it out in a different way that you can actually be positively narcissistic, if there's anything like that. And you can think of yourself first and foremost before you now think about the other things that are coming. So that's something that um, I uh, maybe will be, you may want to highlight a bit more about the positive narcissism, the self-love, the self-focus that's so positive. And then I very much like the Sigmund Freud example. Um, of course, we learned a lot about Sigmund Freud and um, you know, that very, very, um, and, and about the issue of multiple stories. And then, you know, another striking aspect was moving on with the herd. They will fail us. Hmm. You know, you better, it, when you are going through this medical school, you know, they always fail 30%. They were in that medicine, when you look at the results, they will fail. So make sure you enter the cell, you know, because if you are among the last 30, you are going to 30%, you know, the, the, that herd, they, they, and I don't know how we're going to get away from that. And that, it, it breeds anxiety. I remember in my, every time we had exams in medical school, I always used to go home. Luckily for me, my mom lived in Ibadan. I would always go home about two weeks to any, any exam because I couldn't, I didn't like the environment and the, the atmosphere in school. You know, some people thrive in it. But I remember then people will come out and say, ah, Yinka, hey, you have not read, they will not bring out one very rare syndrome, you know, and then everybody's perhaps not, you know, and there's so much anxiety and that's the herd, you know, system. So what I used to do was just leave the school environment and just go home and I would come on as a day student to school and write my exam. That was the way I coped with it because I simply didn't thrive in that um panic of people, you know, going around with the, in the herd and throwing things and making everyone, there's just so much anxiety. But that's something we also need to deal with. And then relating a story to a previous story. So true, so, so true. Um, you, I, you, I entered from one, say new grammar school. I was very anxious. I entered medical school, you know, it's the same, you're, 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 you're starting a new story and there's bound to be anxiety because change always brings anxiety. And that's something that we need to also be prepared for. But the, and then the needs to, you know, re repeat things, telling, telling ourselves the same things, you know, that are positive. And um, like I said, the, 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 that repetition was so important. And then the, sub, the subplots, we need to put in subplots into our curriculum. 
I know there are a couple of subplots, but I don't know if they are uh, now in some of the courses, are they really what we want? Are they really um, helpful? And at the start of the story, when the students come in, are they aware of the subplots? That if it doesn't go this way, that this is yes, then you can always go that way. This is, you know, and so on. Because what is most important is you come to the end destination. And then you couldn't overemphasize again the issue of mentors. And last week we are starting an internet, we have an internationalization agenda in the college, and what I call internationalization and external affairs. And the next day after you had your session, I actually called, we just um, um, employed an admin for that program. And I was telling her about the issue of group mentors, a mentorship bank, that we need to start, not only are we looking for um, alumni in the diaspora to participate in teaching and to come on board as, as members of, um, as adjunct faculty in various departments. And I'm really hoping that the heads of departments and the departments will open up because we need that mix. We need that richness to really get the very best. But what I was, I was um, thinking of was, we need to get alumni to who, can, who want to be part of this mentorship bank. So the alumni, how do we, we, we write out their, what their interests are. And then we have a, mem, a, a mentorship bank, and then we now pair them up with students. And what you have said is, rather than waiting for the hero's story, where the mentor arrives at the 99th minute, when everything is totally disorganized, why don't you bring the mentors early? And how do we get that mentorship program to be built into the curriculum? So like you have said, and I'll end with, with this for other people comment, does the curriculum have subplots? And that's so important as we go on. So I welcome, um, as well with Buki, other comments and other questions. Um, we have quite a number of, um, I can see on here, we have um, Dr. Victor Maconjola. I don't know if he's left. I know he's um, the, he maybe I saw him on for a short while, he's the psychiatrist but is also the chairman, national chairman of the medical um, and dental consultants of Nigeria. So he's taking time out of his very busy time to, to be here with us. So let's have, I know I can see a couple of artists and health artists here. So let's have comments and uh, questions for Buki. Um, any comments? Let's have some, well, do, um, Dr. Dole, the chair of our e-learning has said yes, this, Succinctly put our provost, thank you. The session was really inspiring and insightful as expected. So, so many take home points. Yes. So do we have a couple of us who want to comment um, and share from your own experience? I've shared my own experience or our questions. Let's ask, see if anyone wants to make a few comments. If you don't make comments, I will call you out to make comments. Let me welcome um, Dr. Ejo, Unity Ejo, Dr. Unity Ejo. You're very welcome. He is, um, he used, I worked with him when he was the program manager for MacArthur. And I noticed he had been on from the onset. Dr. Ejo, do you have any comments? You can unmute yourself, even though he's not in the College of Medicine. He's, no, he's not. Okay. I don't think he's commenting. Any other comments? Dr. Adebi, um, Department of Medicine, very much, he's um, a, an IT guru, but he's also a cardiologist. So Dr. Adebi, can you share with us the interface between cardiology and um, information to IT and um, how, what you've gained from this session? Dr. Adebi, you need to unmute yourself. Is he there? No? Okay. So let me try somebody. I need, I'm going to get a couple of people to comment. Um, who else can I see on this? I've seen an Olani George. I don't know if, would um, Olani George like to, is it Dr. Olani George? Would you like to comment? 
Oh, okay. Dr. A just says, my mic seems to be playing out. It's my privilege to have joined the discussions. Dr. Oladijo. Good afternoon, Good afternoon okay. ma. Okay. Thank you so much for the, for the privilege. Um, thank you, Dr. Oshini, um, for the very enlightening um, lecture. I've been uh, part of the series since it started and um, we were having some side chats uh, just a few minutes ago, myself and another colleague who, is, who has been you know, on the call as well. And he said, um, as you were commenting, he said, the provost is shaking some tables with respect to um, medical school and medical training vis-a-vis um, -vis the curriculum. And I said, yes, the provost is a provost for these times. And I want to, first of all, congratulate you for um, introducing this series of lectures and for the wonderful choice you have made in Dr. Oshini. She has um, opened a lot of our eyes to things that we maybe knew somewhere inside of us, but couldn't put um, voice, a voice or words to. Now, with respect to the mentoring, mm. I have, I want to say that I have a feeling that maybe the style of, of medical education also contributes to the herd, the herd of mentality of medical students. And would that be something, I, do, I, I really don't know what obtains in other parts of the world, but do we, for instance, I have um, colleagues who, you know, I started out with, as soon as you cross over and you stick, you stay in that group all the way to the end, you know? So you tend to think the same way, you talk about the same things. Could that contribute to the herd mentality that uh, medical students kind of develop? And is there something that can be done, you know, around that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Olani George. Where are you based? I'm a private practitioner. I'm based in Ibadan. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much for your very insightful comments. Yes, Buki will comment on that. Um, any other comments? Dr. Leshi, human nutrition. I know you've been doing quite a lot of work with, your, with the alumni in your department. So would you like to comment? Well, thank you very much, uh, Provost. Um, thank you so much, Buki, for this uh, presentation. Um, one of the things I, um, I, I intend doing after this session is to really sit back and listen to, to the recordings again, because it's so insightful and a, a lot of reflection are meant to be taken away from this, especially with respect to how we can leverage on the pool of alum, uh, alumni uh, to really learn from them. In, in my department, one of the things that we are currently considering in the course of our curriculum review, uh, based on recent findings, is to, how to leverage on um, the experiences of the alumni, because they brought out the, the fact that the reality in the in the heart, outside world currently does not really relate with one of its, many of the things that we're teaching. And that gap is obvious, it's obvious. That's why uh, most of the students upon graduation, they had to go over training and retraining and retraining for them to be incorporated to the, to the, to the um, organization that they are working, working in. And I also feel that even the style, the approach, that you have actually brought to us this afternoon has also further enlightened us on how to incorporate and make life much more easier in the course of our curriculum um, review. Thank you very much. I'm sure that this definitely uh, is a lot of take home message that we definitely incorporate into our curriculum review. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Leshi. And yes, what you're saying is so true. And that brings us, brings me to another issue of how do we get people in industry, people who, are, who actually are practicing in the outer world, not those of us who are stuck here in the ivory tower. <laughs> you know, we're not, not in the real world. We're the ones doing the teaching, but then we're sending people out to the outside world, to industry, to deal with so many things. 
and we don't bring in the people who are out actually out there to come and as facilitators and teachers. So those are some of the things, or they will say, oh no, the person doesn't have um, experience in teaching. You know, I was talking recently to somebody about, I said, oh no, 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 the person is in industry. You know, to be able to become this or that, you need to have like 10 years of teaching experience in a university. I uh, agree that very much that it's in, but many times you find that in many, I, I was, so I was giving examples. I was saying that a university like Harvard, one of the people I knew very well, I worked for him many, with many years in WHO. He wasn't in a university, he was working as a, um, as the, in the World Health Organization, doing a lot of um, mental health work. And he went straight from there, when he retired from WHO to become a professor in Harvard. Nobody was asking him how many years he had spent in a university. These are some of our traditions. And he just, you know, he was just moved straight in there, professorial grade. You know, well, you know, we are still an evolving system. So I think we need a lot of traditions to keep our stability. But these are some of the things we need to start to think of, of particularly for um, Dr. Leshi. Dr. Leshi is in human nutrition and dietetics. And there's a lot of work going out there in the industry. All these industries, food and so on and so forth. How many of their people are part of their lecturers? on the day-to-day -day system, how much of that? So those are some of the, the aspects. I think I'll hand over to Buki in the absence of any other um, contribution so you can put any your final thoughts um, until we have our next session, uh, the next session next week. Over to you, Buki. Okay, thank you, Dr. Leshi, and thank you, Dr. Olanyi George. Um, the style and the approach, yes, it, it's kind of a head mentality when the style is one size fits all. And there's not much room for uh, variation. I know there were certain things that were given out, advice that was given out that was, you know, uh, I think when you stand in front of the class and you give 200 people tips, then you, it invariably leads to a head mentality because one set of tip, uh, one set of rules does not apply to, cannot apply to 200 people. So for some people, it wouldn't work well. Some people would say, oh, you read X number of hours a day. And everyone takes it as, you know, a fear-filled, classroom takes it all as um, gospel truth and then people begin to run into hurdles um, if they're not able to see that the systems don't work for them like professor said you know living in the university environment and to live in the university environment when you're anxious is, is, is already a terrifying thing to do because it requires courage because you would think if i leave you know people might be discussing the right thing that will end up being question number one and two and i miss out so, but try having that paying attention to understand yourself and knowing that this won't work for me no matter what helps that observation helps to sort of move away from the world. So yes, that head mentality is important. And I guess uh, a good opportunity for the college having so many students is being able to test different approaches and have experiments on certain things and begin to see what works and what doesn't. Um, um, and then regarding industry, absolutely, Dr. Leshi, there's so many opportunities for you know, industry to, to, to have real applications and actually inspiring applications, um, actually being able to access people who are making a living in the field, you know, getting their hands dirty proverbially, and actually inspires people and then people, even without having a personal mentorship relationship, there is that mentorship from afar, where you see someone doing something that's actually quite inspiring and you think, all of a sudden you think this is this is something I would like to do as well. And then you just begin to sort of follow those person's footsteps from afar. So being able to have access to certain different kinds of people is sort of is important for the, um, for the curriculum process as well. So um, yes, I think these are the bits. Uh, and then about positive narcissism, that's what Professor Mukwetu <laughs> said. Well, I, hope I wouldn't call it as a phrase because narcissism is, a, is quite a loaded phrase. So I'll put it in quotes and I would just say, yes, this idea of them. Um, I guess I would maybe I say it's actually consciousness and self-reflection, reflexivity, self-reflexivity, that ability to see oneself not for the purpose of another, but just to see yourself just for the purpose of yourself. And a lot of the um, you know social media has us presenting ourselves for the other. So, but this kind of exercise um, of of self-reflection is 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 for yourself. Um, and that's that's the key difference um, between it. 
and looking at the curriculum having subplots that'll be really fascinating to explore and there's so many opportunities and also it actually brings together the interests of even the lecturers themselves there are um there are teachers with so many interests that they actually want to merge into medicine and are able to sort of teach in a, in a specific light because there are other interests you know, merge with it, even though it's not on the syllabus, but it just creates memorable ideas and memorable moments where people teach things with a little bit of you know, personal, um, personal interest and flavor along. So sometimes the freedom to add in subplots to curriculum as you teach would be absolutely, absolutely fantastic opportunity. So thank you so much. Um, I think that's all from me and I look forward to seeing everyone next week. Um, thank you once again. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wisheni. Thank you for your time, energy, creativity, and so many wonderful things that we're learning, we're enjoying this. It's very refreshing from the work I'm doing at least. <laughs> to have one, something to sit down and listen to. Thank you so much. So we can all, Say hello to each other. Happy new month, everyone. Happy new month, Dr. Happy Adeyemo. new month, Ma. Ah, happy, happy new, new month, month, everyone. Happy, happy, new, Adeyemo. Month, Adeyemo. happy new month, Ma. Happy new month, Ma. Happy new month, Ma. Hello, happy new month. God happy bless you. Happy new month, Ma. Yes, Ma. Happy new month. Okay, yes. God bless you all. Thank you. Have a nice mm -hmm. month. A nice. Week. See you next week. Next week, Wednesday, same time. Okay then. Bye, bye, Bookie. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 bye.